This is lecture four. And this one is on how we got an economy that is killing the life support of our environment, which might be the most important resource we have as a species. So how did that happen? But first, as many of you on the way in tonight said, but are you going to talk about immigration? But are you going to talk about that idiotic appointment? Are you going to... Uh, we could talk about that a lot, but... Um, so I picked my one favorite moment from the many, many choices that, that we have been offered in the last two weeks since we met. I mean, there's sort of high points. Mr. Puzder was not approved, not because he would be the labor secretary who hates human workers, but because he had a, a, a spousal abuse issue that some Republicans were more moral about. Uh, then um, they were worried about his labor policies. And then we've had an interesting kerfluffle about the uh, National Security Advisor. Mr. Flynn apparently was very naughty. And uh, apparently he didn't know better. I, I have the feeling that a lot of people don't know any better in this administration. That's not an excuse, however. So uh, we, we had that one. But what really stuck out recently was the campaign rally that President Trump had in Florida on Saturday, in which case he reviewed sort of his campaign points. And among other things, he said, and we have to stop these terrorists coming in to our borders, and we have to prevent things of the sort that happened in Nice and in Stockholm yesterday, Sweden yesterday. The world was puzzled. What happened in Sweden? Swedes were puzzled, deeply. <laughs> they were perhaps the most puzzled of all about what might have happened in their country. And they actually asked for an explanation. What, what do you think happened in our country yesterday? <laughs> this kind of stuff began making the rounds on social media. I think it will be a lot less expensive than our border wall, but harder to assemble. <laughs> he clarified that actually what he was talking about didn't happen in Sweden, it happened on Tucker Carlson's program the night before on Fox News, in which Tucker Carlson was interviewing a right-wing filmmaker who talked about immigration problems uh, in Sweden uh, in, in, in the film that he's made. So that was a little different, that what happened in Sweden actually was happening on Fox News. And then in response to this tweet, we now have tweet diplomacy. Uh, the Swedish embassy said, we'd really like to talk to you about what's happening in Sweden, if you have the time, and can pull yourself away from Fox News. So we will see if this is the new foreign policy that, that we are uh, living with. But I, I want to say one thing about these amusing openers, because we can't ignore what's going on out there. But Trump is not the problem, seriously not the problem. Trump is a symptom of a much bigger set of problems. And that's what this lecture series is about. What are the bigger problems that give us Trump, and it might give us someone scarier than Trump if the progress of the radical right continues and the lack of progress unifying a left progressive set of policies and ideas doesn't happen. So all of these trends, and I've been studying for the last year, the rise of the right around the world democracies, and, and it's, it's rising and the left is not, by any comparable measure. But these are symptoms of much deeper institutional decline. So we've got dysfunctional economic and political systems that are driven by bad ideas, but ideas that have been coded into law and policy 
and supported by the power of business to keep them in place. So in a way, this lecture is, is, is a discussion of why ideas matter. Why, I mean, I, I've spent my whole life pursuing ideas, thinking about ideas, occasionally creating an original one or two, but really taking ideas seriously. And, and I think we should all take ideas seriously because they are the foundation of institutions and politics and social reality. So the question is, where do new ideas come from? And are there any new ones on the horizon when we so desperately need them today? So the story I'm going to tell is this. How world politics became captured by these ideas, neoliberal market deregulation and economic growth at implausible, unsustainable levels. Those ideas have produced an economic system that doesn't work well for very many people but the wealthy, and that is threatening life support on the planet. So that's what I mean by bad ideas. And in order to not leave us in despair, we will talk about promising new ideas that are out there, and I'm going to suggest ways in which we can all engage with them. Okay, so the big ideas of our time. I spend a lot of time uh, when I'm not lecturing or uh, doing other things, sitting in department meetings, playing with a lot of interesting toys. And this is one that's available to any of us on Google. It's called the Google Ngram. Uh, Ngrams are kind of linguistic um, concepts that involve word strings of, of n length. Two, two words, three words, four word associations that occur in language and that occur, it turns out, in books. And for a while, before the publishers of the world cracked down on Google, Google had a project of scanning all the world's books. Can you imagine that? They thought it was a wonderful idea, and, and I do too, but the publishers somehow objected to that. So uh, the publishers finally put the clamps on it around 2005, but our story is well underway by then. So, so I did a Google Ngram on all of the word pairs involving global. In all of the books in print in the English language between 1950 and 2005. And what's interesting is you see there's global markets, global economics, global climate, but it's, here's the two big ones, global warming and global economy. So those, in terms of the literatures that people who read are reading, when they come across the word global, it's most likely to be paired with economy or warming. Question is though, what's the relationship? And I think the relationship looks like this. is that instead of global economy and global warming being nicely compatible, they are in tension at odds and in conflict. So we've learned a lot in the last couple of lectures, the one before in particular, that growth and gross domestic product doesn't necessarily produce prosperity. In fact, many, including Larry Summers, are beginning to think that growth is over. And what are we going to do about that? Indeed, even if it's not over, life on the planet may be over because of it. That might be a reason to think about economic growth a little bit more carefully than we have in the past. And indeed, there are people doing that. There are still lots and lots and lots of people bringing ideas out about sustainable economics and environmentally sensitive economics. So, this contradiction between the environment and the economy, jobs versus remedying climate change in our everyday political discourse, didn't anybody see it coming? Sure. The answer is millions 
and millions of people saw it coming. This was a well-known problem as early as the 1960s. I mean, you can take it back to Thoreau and the Transcendentalists, but, but it, indeed in, in our modern era, um, there were warnings, probably beginning most importantly with Rachel Carson and her uh, warning about the industrialization of agriculture, which produced the miracle of feeding more people at the price of poisoning our environment, our water, our air, and perhaps causing epidemics of cancer that had not been seen at those levels before. But at the same time, there were all of these other interesting books. Kenneth Boulding published a, an important piece on the economics of Spaceship Earth. Kenneth Boulding was John Kennedy's environmental advisor, though an economist, uh, which was an enlightened choice at the time. Uh, Barbara Ward, a uh, British scholar, uh, pioneered the idea of Spaceship Earth. And then Buckminster Fuller, uh, anybody ever remember the yurts and the geodesic domes, yeah. Uh, and then this was on my bedside table in 1968. How many of you had a copy? Yeah. So, so, so this, and then this picture of the Earth from outer space became a, a iconic. I mean, it, it, it reminded us of how fragile we are and how self-contained we are. There's no supply ships coming in from outside. And then, shortly thereafter, economists began to get in the game. The Club of Rome, uh, so to speak, was uh, formed um, to, to think about what an economy would look like in this finite ecosystem. And these ideas were developed by Herman Daly uh, and others into the concept of steady state e e economics. So by, from 1962 to 1972, or 73, we actually had the concept that the Earth is fragile, it has finite resources, and we need an economic system that can operate, we need an operating system that works within those limits, and here's not a bad one. So what happened? What happened? We had all of this in place, and it became popular. It's not that these were wonky books that nobody was reading. International bestsellers, huge, tens of millions, 20, 30 million copies distributed around the globe in different languages. These were huge. Peanuts got into the game uh, as Lucy tells Charlie Brown that she's got a girl's bat and instead of Willie Mays on the uh, label, it's got Rachel Carson. The government put out stamps. The Earth Day was held in 1970, the first one, and these kinds of images became uh, viral in the day. So th this launched probably the largest, most sustained social movement that the world has ever seen. And it's still there today. We're going to come back to that in a couple of minutes. And people are still writing about these ideas. Bill McKibben, I'm sure most of you know uh, his work, and uh, I'll introduce more of it in a few minutes. So given this scientific basis, popular acceptance and social activism about these ideas, a steady state economy within planetary boundaries, why isn't that what we got? Why isn't that what we got? That's why. So I'm going to talk about how we got this instead. So if you took a poll of the people on the planet, Steady state economics or something like it would have been overwhelmingly voted in. Overwhelmingly. It would be today, too. It would be today, too. But somehow we got a very different system. One based on deregulated markets, government that serves business, and that promises voters growth. On, on improbable levels of growth. So how did this happen? Well, let me do a little quick historical tour. The idea of managing and producing economic growth is pretty recent historically. If you look at the US 
at the turn of uh, the 20th century. We were the world's largest economy at that point, but there was no government mandate theory or tool to manage growth. It just happened because of vast resources, territorial expansion, seizing lands from native peoples, exploiting the resources of those lands in a wild, wild rush to the west coast, and taking over a few other parts in, of the world you know, in the process. And there was no Federal Reserve, no income tax. How did all that happen? How did we grow so big? Well, people began to ask that question. How can we bottle this? How can we make this happen regularly, routinely? By 1950, laws required the president to present a budget to Congress and issue economic projections that were coordinated with fiscal, monetary, credit, trade, regulatory powers, all aimed at creating growth and preventing shrinkage. And thanks to World War II, and us being largely the biggest winner of World War II, we and much of the northern world experienced an unprecedented economic boom, which interestingly enough, thanks to the power of trade unions and the sense that society should benefit somewhat equitably from economic growth, people actually did share in much of the growth. If you look at income distribution, the rich still got richer, but not in, at the levels, the un, un, unbelievable levels that we see today. And as a result of this boom, we have a demand side pressure as well for growth coming from voters. Voters like it. They can buy new cars, nicer houses, go shopping more often. So all of those things have led us to think that growth is eternal, an entitlement, something that can be just produced through the wizardry of these kinds of economic tools. Now, how did neoliberalism get into this growth economy? Because remember, that growth from the 50s and 60s wasn't being produced by neoliberal economics at all. It was being produced by Keynesian economics. Government was the driver of the economy. Build new roads, build schools, build universities like this, and everyone will prosper, which turned out to be fairly true up to a point. So Keynesianism and World War II more or less bailed the world out of the Great Depression of the 30s. But something terrible happened in the mid-60s. This perfect storm of colossal expenditures without commensurate revenues, and the fact that the oil producing countries organized themselves to become a cartel to set world oil prices to get compensated for all the growth that cheap oil had been fueling uh, before that in time. And the world entered a kind of a full stop economy. Gas lines formed, the economy shrank, debts couldn't be paid off, the US was in a huge balance of payments deficit that were, at this point in time, payable in gold that the US couldn't buy enough of to pay off at the set price of gold on the world market. We were in a crisis. Most of us in this room uh, remember that crisis. So the conclusion that many people drew whether this is the right conclusion or not, I can't say, but many people decided Keynesianism no longer works. Now, it turns out Keynesianism has still worked. We just witnessed the biggest outburst of Keynesian economics ever in the bank bailouts, although Keynes might not be so happy with that uh, target of all of that money. But in any event, that was a Keynesian uh, rebound. But in the meantime, so we have this opportunity. Think of the, the, the crisis of the 60s and 70s as 
an opportunity for new ideas to come into play. There are always ideas sitting in the wings, but it sometimes takes crisis or other kinds of opportunities for them to move into center stage. So neoliberalism, as I introduced it briefly a couple of lectures ago, and we'll talk a little bit more about it tonight, had been around for a long time. It was born of Viennese economists in the, the 20s who were horrified at how badly the post-World War I economies were working in Europe, in part because of the disastrous way in which the US and allied victors set the terms uh, for European countries to buy their way back into the world of nations. But in any event, um, and, and most of those governments were inspired by the Russian Revolution and had adopted uh, planning models of economies, but they had very few resources to plan with. So, so it was a scenario uh, doomed for failure, and the short story is, so we got World War II. But in the meantime, a lot of economists were thinking, we can't have these planned economies, we have to have freer markets, and more importantly, planning deadens the individual spirit, creativity, freedom. So there's a line of succession from Friedrich von Hayek, who is the, sort of the leading of these Viennese economists, although von Mises, and there were several vons uh, involved in these uh, circles. Uh, you could draw a direct line to Milton Friedman. So there were academic experts who were supplying the ideas, and then there was demand on the part of politicians who wanted an alternative to the Keynesian economic model and wanted something to offer voters. So you get center stage, Margaret Thatcher, Ronald Reagan, and many others, many other neoliberal politicians who bought these ideas. And then they were resonant because there were popular culture figures like Ayn Rand, who wrote these novels that became bestsellers about heroic individuals struggling against the oppressions of government regulation and other things. And then, this was part of the genius of the movement, and this is a movement. Um, they decided to create think tanks. Now it turns out it was easier for them to do this because they had access to people with a lot of money. And Hayek said, these are the second-hand dealers in ideas. I create the ideas, but then these think tanks are going to sell them to journalists, to politicians, and in turn to publics. So in 1980, when Thatcher was in power, Reagan was coming to power, there were 40 neoliberal think tanks in 20 nations, and today, by my count, there are 470 nations. So almost every country that is a player in the world economy has got one or more of these think tanks supplying journalists, supplying politicians, and providing the material to share to broader publics to support these ideas. So some of these you're familiar with. In the 1930s, there was something called the American Enterprise Association, which became the American Enterprise Institution, Institute, uh, and in 1950, Milton Friedman joined the board and turned it into a thoroughly neoliberal think tank. The Heritage Foundation, dedicated to these core concepts of Hayek's thought. Can somebody get that? Um, the Cato Institute, uh, co-founded by Charles Koch, of the Koch brothers, and, and Hayek was on the editorial board. And then the Manhattan Institute, which is an interesting one, was founded by William Casey, who later became Ronald Reagan's campaign manager and director of the CIA. So you can see how tight-knit these circles were that joined together around these very simple ideas, super simple ideas, and, and how they were able to promote them because of their positions uh, in and around government. So if you think about the original ideas, and, and Hayek wrote a number of books, um, Road to Serfdom is the one that Ronald Reagan kept on his bedside table. 
And the Constitution of Liberty is the one that Margaret Thatcher pounded on her cabinet table and said, this is what we believe. And anyone in her cabinet who didn't wasn't going to last very long. But around this core idea were really powerful intellectuals. Walter Lippmann, who engineered the brilliant public relations concept, making the world safe for democracy, that helped us get into and out of World War I, was uh, an important early associate of Hayek's. Uh, and, and this is another core concept. What's the role of government? Well, one is to protect our territory, to provide security, but the other is to not administer the affairs of men, but to administer justice in the affairs of people. That's a very subtle but important concept. There was Karl Popper, who was one of the great philosophers of the day, um, and Popper promoted the idea that a free society is a society in which there are no government restrictions on ideas and in which science is allowed to flourish. And the, the role of science in this idea set is very problematic, I will just say for now, and we'll talk about it in a minute, how problematic it was. But Popper was an early influential uh, thinker who filled out Hayek's ideas so that people understood freedom of speech, yes, and freedom of, of publication, yes, but freedom of scientific inquiry was for Popper the whole foundation of the free society itself. It would allow us to flourish through medical discoveries and space exploration and all kinds of things that no highly regulated society could compete with. Then there was Ayn Rand, Russian emigre, who wrote all of these books, Atlas Shrugged. Uh, anyone know who John Galt is? Uh, and then her immediate disciple is this guy, who was the head of the US Federal Reserve from about the mid 80s till just before the financial meltdown uh, that we, just before he just left in time. Um, and, and he shrugged when asked, how did this happen? Ah, I didn't think it was possible, uh, was basically what he said. And then of course there's Milton Friedman, Nobel laureate, and a disciple, direct disciple of Hayek. So, so this is the kind of intellectual brain power that was on display in this group. Now, sometimes really smart people can get behind kind of dumb ideas for interesting reasons, for interesting reasons. So here's the core idea that we need to have minimal government and market choices in order to have individual freedom, and this runs through all of those thinkers, and that if markets are left alone because governments don't really know what they're doing, and there's some reason to think that is true in many cases, right? I mean, how do governments decide how to regulate the internet when they don't understand it? But, but those, are, those are always questions that uh, exist when government tries to manage something. But here's the part that is an assumption that turned out to be, let's just say, questionable. That left alone, markets will produce spontaneous order. Come back to that in a minute. So how did these ideas come into such ubiquitous and, and complete everyday presence in our lives. There's probably no day that passes for any one of us that isn't affected for good or for bad, and for most people it's for bad, by these ideas. So if you think about the core of the brain trust, turns out that, that Sweden helped here because Sweden loved the Chicago School of Economics and the Nobel Committee began giving Nobel Prizes almost yearly to 
the Chicago economist, and to Hayek himself. So, so if you think about branding of ideas, I mean, there are few brands bigger in the world today for ideas than the Nobel Prize. So Nobel laureates in, were central to this group, were pres, present and indeed presidents of the uh, original thought collective which met every year in a lovely Swiss village overlooking Lake Geneva called Mont Pelerin and is to this day still called the Mont Pelerin Society, although it meets more around the world, wherever some wealthy business person uh, has the money to host the events. So the Mont Pelerin Society started with these folks and with people like Lippmann and, and Popper and, and uh, others public intellectuals came to these meetings beginning, actually they began before the war in Paris, Walter Lippmann came and talked with Hayek and, and, and after the war um, they expanded to this group of, of luminaries um, and then they hit on the brilliant idea of producing these think tanks and the think tanks made this happen. Now the think tanks cost money so there is money in this story and we shouldn't forget that. So, so our challenge is if we think we are on the trail of some pretty good ideas better than these, how do we do it with less money? David said that I can do miracles with $70,000. Uh, and, and actually that's true. But the question is, what would it take, let's think about what it would actually take to, to find the think tanks and the, the, the thought networks and the promotion of those ideas to actually make them much more familiar and, and everyday uh, wisdom. So anyway, the think tanks were huge. They spread first in the US and the UK and then around the world. And politicians uh, joined up, Pinochet being among the most notorious, Thatcher and Reagan being among the most famous, uh, Vaclav Klaus, Berlusconi, all of these people were feeding from the supply of these ideas produced by these think tanks and indeed uh, often coming to the Mont Pelerin Society meetings uh, themselves. Interestingly enough, and there's another plot twist in our story, Hayek was a bit suspicious of business. So he didn't fill his society with business elites except for the need to fund their nice hotel and amenities in Switzerland every year. So he would invite just the right amount of rich people to pay the bill. But as you might imagine, business people love these ideas. So that's kind of how it worked at the core. Think of this as a social movement for elites, for rich people and their intellectual muses. But around this, and even before um, the Mont Pelerin Society formed, the International Chamber of Commerce had been prom promoting these kinds of ideas. Uh, the Rockefellers, the Rockefellers, by the way, funded heavily many of the think tanks and the meetings of the Mont Pelerin Society, but also created the Trilateral Commission, Rockefellers, Henry Kissinger, uh, and the Bilderberg meetings, a little seaside village in the Netherlands. Um, that was kind of like the business meeting equivalent of the Mont Pelerin Society. And then the World Economic Forum, you know about the Davos gathering of the rich and the famous, including Bono and rock stars and people like that who want to try and change the world from the top. And so you've got these peripheral networks and if you look at the network maps coming out from here but moving through all of these other networks, it's incredibly dense, incredibly interconnected, and incredibly high level. It's amazing who's in these networks. Pretty much everybody who's rich and in power in the world. So how did this set of ideas, very simple ideas, how did it work? And here's a book that's uh, kind of a nice, simple introduction to how it spread over the world. So you start with simple utopian ideas. I mean, this is a utopian vision. This isn't deep economics. It's, it's deep utopianism. 
that were promoted by networks of think tanks and politicians and journalists. Journalists feed from these idea generators as well. And they were easy to sell to publics. So as you're thinking about what might the alternative that we would be happier with, what, what might that look like? Think about these characteristics. Free markets, individual, largely consumer freedoms. I mean, that's kind of what it, the bottom line translates into. And personal responsibility. Very popular, easy to sell, even in China. Because it's a skeletal idea system that can be adapted to various cultural differences. And then it's been expanded and kept in place by government and business coalitions. That Popper and, and none of these guys ever really, really figured out how to deal with. Business was kind of an annoying, under-theorized piece of this idea system. How to keep it in line. So there are some fatal assumptions in this idea system, as, as you may have suspected. So what are they? What are the fatal assumptions on which neoliberalism depends? Well, this one, that unregulated markets create a spontaneous order, and that companies, this was Alan Greenspan's shrug when asked by Congress how this happened under his watch, how this financial, this global financial crisis happened under his watch, he said, I didn't think business would be so irresponsible. <laughs> and then that government would not be corrupted by business. I don't know how they figured that it would just happen on its own. But again, it's utopian. So it doesn't need to be finely tuned to empirical reality. So this was Greenspan's shrug when uh, asked how this financial crisis happened after he had pioneered so much deregulation and presided over the economy for all the years leading up to it. Never occurred to me that businesses wouldn't protect their own shareholders or their own investors. Wow, what a concept. So this is a commercial break <laughs> while you're digesting these assumptions. What's the difference between an, a utopian idea scheme and science? Well, I'm sorry, Bill Nye is not here tonight to answer that question. I think he would give a great answer to it. But here's the key, which was revealed in this amazing mathematical proof by a mathematician named Kurt Gödel, um, who basically said that all idea systems have at least one, and most indeed, like neoliberalism, have many more unprovable assumptions. Now, in science, this turns out to be a good thing, because it means that science is never proven. It's always a work in progress. Theories are always subject to critis criticism and new data and change. Now, sometimes science gets rooted in paradigms and resistant to change. That's another story. But most of the time, if we're practicing real science, paradigms yield eventually to new information and better assumptions, and then are challenged again. So that's the scientific process. And here is Gödel receiving the first Albert Einstein Award, so I, I, I worked Al into this lecture too, uh, as I have the others. And, and it's widely regarded among scientific communities that the three greatest scientific ideas of the 20th century were Eisen, uh, Einstein's relativity theorem, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, which I won't bother you with, but it's very important, and Gödel's proof. This changed the whole way of thinking about science and informs my thinking about what would a good economic theory actually look like if it were really scientific. So think about that. So the conclusion is neoliberalism is sort of more religion than science. In fact, Karl Popper broke with Hayek at some point by thinking these folks are not scientists, they're utopian uh, religious cults. So 
indeed the core idea that markets will create perfect order has only existed when there is total economic chaos. And, 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 and I mean, unregulated markets have only existed when there is total economic chaos and they don't produce perfect order. So, and the idea that there's a natural order is kind of like the immaculate conception <laughs> assumption of this economic model. So every theory has these unprovable assumptions. The question is, are you willing to submit your theory to empirical critical scrutiny and change the assumptions or are you insistent that it is the perfect utopian vision that cannot be changed? And that's the category that neoliberalism has been in pretty much from the beginning. And then about the fact that business surely wouldn't corrupt government, what a surprise. But here's an interesting question. If, a, if an idea system fails as badly as neoliberalism failed, well, has been failing for many years now, but failed catastrophically in 2008 and continues to be not doing well, if, if that idea system failed, why is it still in power? Well, the answer involves power. So despite all the flaws, this idea system, and despite the public anger, I mean, these are pieces from the press in the UK about why aren't the bankers going to jail? There were similar ones from our press. Why aren't the bankers in jail? Good question. We need them. The economy depends on them. They're too big to fail. So we must bail. So that's sort of how all of that went down. So corporate and banking power is deemed by those in power necessary to keep our economy going. And of course, those who think it are supported by banks and businesses, as I said last time, to stay in office and make policy that favors their clients. And then the voters have a part in this too. Voters like growth. Citizens like growth. People like to go shopping. People like to have new cars, new houses. It's something that we're all, most of us, somewhat addicted to, is economic growth. So that power scheme kept neoliberalism in place after most people felt, many critics on the left felt, okay, that's it. The system has collapsed. It's been exposed. It will surely, it will surely go away. No, it's, it's actually doubled down. We have austerity policies around the world. Look at Greece, look at the southern and the Mediterranean democracies. So, so actually it has become more extractive. Look at the tuition rates that students at this university are paying after the financial crisis. Neoliberal economics has become even more extractive of citizens to support those at the top. So, Remember I said that there were far more popular ideas at the time of the last great opportunity, the financial crisis of the 60s and 70s. Far more people supporting far different ideas that were just as simple as neoliberal ideas and that were more open to critical assessment and more likely to provide an economy that works better for people on the planet. So let's go back to what happened to all those good ideas from the 60s and 70s that were widely popular, had fueled a huge social movement that made people want a different kind of economy. Well, it turns out that those ideas turned into something that was subordinate to the growth economy. 
that people thought they could have growth and sustainability all at the same time. And it sounded catchy because it was called sustainable development. Nice idea, if only it were possible. So the international institutions were pressured by this social movement which was still in the streets and still compelling protests all over the world, international institutions and governments were pressured to do something about the environment. So sustainable development became the new idea set that was put into place to try and satisfy this broad public and it was put into place by the United Nations, first and foremost. In an interesting uh, report called Our Common Future, and this report defined the notion of sustainable development in very appealing ways. We can have growth and we can save the environment. Didn't say how, just said we can. And everybody wanted to believe this. Lots of people wanted to believe this. So it's a very fuzzy idea then, and it's just as fuzzy today. But it sounds nice, and it's so reassuring. So I did another one of these engrams on all the words in all the books in the English language published between 1950 and in this time 2008, which is when Google really was finally put out of business on this project. And it turns out that sustainable development is the most, by far, common word pair with sustainable. You see, here's, there's, there's sustainable economy and economics down there, but it's, it's down here. But sustainable development took over the world discourse. It quickly became domesticated. Every country began to think of its own economic policy as sustainable, even though most were not. And the problem, the reason why most countries never achieved any kind of sustainable economic policy set is because economic growth, again, all the books in English between 1950 and 2005, uh, and word pairs, economic growth compared to sustainable development and climate change, growth is the most important concept of our time in this arena. It's the God term of our civilization. Even though it now appears clear that the levels of growth during this period were unprecedented before and won't happen again. I talked about that two lectures ago. And environmentally, growth is a disaster for these kinds of reasons. Extraction and resource depletion costs, waste costs, which are now being externalized both in economic models and in reality, and the true cost of our products as part of this externalization of the problem. So, so what do publics hear when they hear politicians and think tanks and journalists talk about the economy and the environment? Well, it turns out that what they hear when they hear newspaper discussions about the environment is they hear sustainability as an environmental concept and growth is the dominant economic concept. So another one of the toys I play around with, uh, which is kind of a wonky tool, but it gives me access to all the world's news articles every day. Imagine that, you thought you were overloaded. So, so and, and it helps me understand the semantic networks, the connections among terms in all those articles. So here's, um, in the month of May, I searched the, the, the world English language press for sustainability, uh, and I came up with uh, 12,000 articles. And, and the core here is climate and environment. And out here, you get a little bit of corporate responsibility discussion because companies want to be green. Most of this is green uh, corporate uh, discussions. And then you get the United Nations and if you look at the sources of, of this news discussion, it's world organizations, African Development Bank, United Nations Development Organization, and interestingly enough, 
environmental organizations have bought into sustainable development because many of them felt that that's sort of the best they can do. Well, even though it's not doing enough. So, even though it is clear that sustainable development didn't deliver, it was renewed. So two years ago, the United Nations renewed its sustainable development goals with even less realistic goals attached. So they think that they can produce 7% growth in the southern world. Hello. What were they on? But it, this was celebrated, it was adopted, and committed to. But it will never be realized, not even close. China is now talking about green growth, and we see how well that's going. But the important question is, how are these ideas going in our everyday lives? How are these discussions that we read about in the papers, that we have in world forums, national legislatures, how are they going in reality? Not well. It turns out that the planet is still losing its life support capacity. A, a, a group centered in Stockholm, Johan Rickström, um, ha, has looked at, at what they call planetary boundaries, trying to assemble scientific research on climate change, on, on uh, land system changes, freshwater, uh, biochemical flows, acidification, all of these things. The only thing that actually has had progress made is, is the ozone depletion problem. So there's one glimmer of good news here. It's actually getting better. But as you can see, in many ways, this group thinks that it's getting worse in very uh, important ways. So as we reach life support limits on the planet, this is not uncontroversial. There are scientists who don't think you can do this. I mean, some scientists who are working on one or more of these areas think that you can't really step back from their one area and look at the picture like this and, and just say this is how it is. So, so there is some uh, controversy surrounding this, but on the other hand, it's a good faith effort by scientists to summarize what we know about the condition of the planet that has been driven by our economy. So many people think technology is going to save us. Indeed, you, you probably read about it in the business magazines. We're going to put a solar, solar array across uh, the North African desert. Sure we will. And, and a solar array just in the northwest corner of Arizona could power the entire city of Phoenix. Perhaps it could. The question is, how does all of this stuff scale? And scaling is the big question. So there are a lot of myths uh, about techno fixes. Many people think that we are now producing so much more efficient energy that we can actually disconnect carbon fossil fuel energy production from our economic production and we will eventually reach a point where we are uh, producing economic growth with so much less resource inputs that we will actually uh, achieve some kind of carbon neutrality. Turns out there is some suggestion that if you look at this idea of relative decoupling, which is the it, in, in bottom line terms, how much CO2 emissions per GDP US dollar, you see that there actually is some truth to that claim, that there is some decoupling, that you are getting more bang for the buck uh, with less CO2 attached. But the problem that comes back to haunt us again and again is, and, and, and it needs to go much lower than this, by the way, there's a real question about, will this, even on its own, in absolute terms, will this ever get low enough to make the difference we need? But it certainly will never come close if we continue to grow. So if you then begin to look at CO2 production and growth, you see that the overall trajectory is just in the opposite direction. So once again, growth kind of comes back to haunt us. 
in this story. So this is the point in the program where we take a pause, absorb all of this dizzying information, and go to this lecture series feature. <laughs> what do we do tonight? Let's change the conversation. So this is a story about ideas, ideas that swept the planet, ideas propelled by an elite social movement that had money and power behind it. So are there ideas out there that might balance neoliberalism in simplicity and popular appeal? And if so, how can we promote them? That's the key. So there are a lot of things we could do to change the conversation. This is just a sketch, okay? We clearly, if we're gonna have a slower growth economy, we need to deal with these things, and we will have to deal with Wall Street and the offshore banking and finance empires. All of that is gonna, and it's not gonna be pretty. As you know, these are powerful people with a loud megaphone, aided and abetted by our own beloved Supreme Court, who want to he be able to express even more loudly how important growth is and how important it is to let people do any kind of economic activity they want in a free society. We need to think about local and sustainable and durable, and we need to address this in much more important ways rather than shipping dead computers and technology to African slums where they're burned uh, up and go into the water and air that children uh, are living with. We need more of this. We're getting some of it. This is probably one of the best conversations going on the planet today. And then we can add those prosperity measures that I've been talking about to our sense of what is a good economy. What does a good economy produce? So here's some personal options. I mean, I, I'm, I don't feel it's my job to sort of tell you what to do. I mean, you're, you're, you're all doing stuff, and I know you'll figure out what to do. But, but when I think about what should I be doing, here are some things that come to mind. First of all, remembering to think like this. So, what is nested within what, and what is accountable to what in our world. But find ways in any action we take to think about whether we are addressing all of these things somehow, or not harming them somehow. And can we scale it? Can we do local versions and national and global versions? Not exactly the same things, but similar kinds of things. So my daily reminder to myself is whatever I'm doing, I sort of want to run it through three checkpoints. What kind of an economy do we want? Well, you know, what's the economy for? We should all have that question. Next Thanksgiving, we should have this question. What kind of an economy do we want that we're being thankful for here? Uh, how can it work better? What kind of a democracy do we want? What is the democracy for? Is it really to represent the rich? And where do the people fit in? How can we, the people, actually take back our representative form of government? That's an important agenda item for all of us. Bigger than Trump. Trump is a symptom. This is the problem. And then what kind of an environment do we want? What's the environment for? Is it something to mine and harvest and pollute so this generation can be the last hurrah? Or is it something that we want to protect so that life on the planet will go on and prosper under a different kind of economy? So to me, those are the three elements of, of my holy grail as I think about how do I spend my valuable time every day? But how do we insert these ideas into our politics? So this is sort of my personal checklist, but 
But if we go back to the story of neoliberalism, there are sort of four morals to that story of how it came into power and swept the planet and stayed on long after its welcome wore off. There was a moment of opportunity. Okay. That, that crisis of the 60s and 70s was the opening that neoliberalism drove through. We have another moment of opportunity right now. There were public intellectuals, smart people, who were able to write in simple terms, who were promoting these ideas. Where are they today? I'm going to come back to that. And the neoliberals created a movement, though it was an elite movement, a well-funded movement, um, but they were able to spread their ideas through think tanks and political parties and other kinds of institutions. And then those ideas have stayed on because they've been imposed through political power. So what are the parallels that we might imagine if we wanted more this kind of idea set to be put in play in our country and in our world that we might learn from the story of neoliberalism. Well, let's look at these things in, in context of a different set of ideas. So, is there a political opportunity? Yes. But interestingly enough, the current opportunity of economic stagnation and institutional failure and public anger is being seized by the right, not the left. What's going on there? Are there public intellectuals? Yes. And many of them actually are producing ideas that bridge these three big areas that I think need to be addressed together. Here's one of them. This book is available as a free PDF download if you go online. It's a, it's a wonderful book. And then is there a popular equivalent to that elite movement? But is there a popular movement on the planet today that might embrace this agenda? So think about that for a second. And I'll tell you what I think it is. So the opportunity, the global crisis of confidence in the economy and in the government is huge, huge. It has produced protests across the spectrum from the Tea Party to Occupy and these protests aren't going to go away. So people are angry, they're in the streets. The question is, do they have a message? Well, the right does. The right has a message. What about the left? What about progressives? Where's the message? And are there public intellectuals? Yes, Tim Jackson is, is one of my favorites because he got this a long time ago. Actually, uh, he was appointed to chair the Sustainable Development Commission in the UK under the Gordon Brown government. And the first thing his commission did is to basically say, Sustainable development is a hoax. It's an oxymoron. We need to rethink the economy in context of the environment. Now, it turns out the minute the conservatives got in power, uh, he and the commission were fired. But they had a moment when they actually had public attention in the UK. The Pope. Pope is one of my favorite public intellectuals these days. I don't agree with him on everything, but I don't agree with anybody on everything. But I do think the Pope has had some powerful things to say about the economy and the environment. Really powerful things. So he's close to embracing this kind of a message. And he has a lot of followers. Can they join a vast global movement? Bill McKibben who recognizes that climate change is about power and if we're going to win the, the climate fight, we need a different economy. So Bill McKibben is talking in these terms. And his organization, 350, is probably the fastest growing global climate change organization. Easy to join 
and people are doing things. Naomi Klein, who's going to come in uh, April, right here in Kane Hall. We've invited her and she accepted. Uh, so we will tell you more about that later. But uh, when I first read her book, This Changes Everything, how many of you read This Changes Everything? Um, I thought, I agree with it, it's interesting, it's radical, it's angry. These are not times for docility. I said, but are people going to buy the idea that she's selling about democratic socialism? Well, it turns out, yeah, they are. Bernie Sanders almost brought a new generation of citizens into the Democratic Party. Now, the Democratic Party, unfortunately, operates rather like a cartel, a neoliberal political cartel, and didn't especially want to address the demands of those new citizens. So that struggle is still unresolved. But I, I think that there is now an opportunity to rethink democratic socialism. Socialism in a democratic representative context that enables people to ask and answer the question of what is the economy for? How radical is that? In fact, if you didn't call it socialism, it wouldn't feel radical at all. It would almost feel like plain old common sense. So let's not call it socialism. Why burden ourselves with a term that is only going to be a lightning rod? So let's just talk about what's the economy for? And how do we get our democracy back? And how do we operate within environmental limits? Those questions don't require political labeling. Although they might be labeled by others, but they don't need us to label uh, them at all. Now, back to that question of, is there a movement on the planet today that could do all of this stuff? And the answer is, yeah. The same movement that generated those early ideas about a sustainable economy within environmental limits is still there and still producing ideas of the sort that it's been producing for the last 50 years. But that movement is winning battles while losing the war because environmental organizations think that they're dealing with the environment. And if they would just move a little bit closer to dealing with the economy, they'd win the environmental battle easily. So shifting the frame just a tiny little bit if you're an environmentalist or you're supporting an environmental organization to encourage your environmental group to have an economic discussion and get behind economic action. So it's time for environmental organizations and indeed the whole environmental movement, I think, because I see them as the best chance we've got for a popular movement that already exists. We don't have to create a new movement, it's there. So this popular movement exists and all it needs to do is add messages about realistic growth, socially responsible investment, equity, and democratic change. Voila. How simple is that? And how simple is that? And look at these organizations. Huge memberships. And there are many, many more organizations like, like 350 that, that have vast and uncounted memberships because they're not really membership organizations. They're networks. So Canada is beginning to generate this kind of a concept of political change, economic change, and environmental protection. In the LEAP Manifesto, which has been led by native peoples with values that reflect their understanding and their life in nature, but it is something that is spreading around Canada and, and is a very interesting model that, that we might think about emulating. So as David uh, said earlier, we're trying to do our bit sort of baking these ideas 
into a resource center for students and particularly organized groups on campus, student groups, to come and build bridges so that fair trade organizations can find environmental organizations, can find political uh, PERG type organizations and talk together about common projects to turn this entire campus into a learning community. So that's my, what I'm doing, uh, and with your help I can do it better. Uh, we can do it better. Some of the students are here tonight, and, and Derek, who uh, I, I can't exist without, uh, is here and he needs to pay the rent. Uh, so, so we're doing this stuff locally, but we also hope to begin to generate a global thought collective to share these ideas around the world with people who are working on them, to bring them together and to figure out how to feed them to activists just the way the neoliberals fed their ideas to elites. So it's a little bit different business model, if you will, but I think it's one that's worth trying. So thanks very much. Okay, so those who need to go, um, thanks for coming. See you in two weeks. And uh, when people have left, I will then answer questions. Can one of uh, Sky, Kelsey, do you want to run the mic around? My name is Ben, and I, I live in the U District, but I'm not a student. Um, I was wondering, there, there seem to be uh, two contradictory statements that you made. Um, you, you pointed out that not just the elites, but the public have come to expect economic growth, um, you know, economic ideas being, uh, the, the dominant economic ideas being that we need all this growth when in fact it's a bad idea. But you also said earlier, that you think that if we'd had a planetary plebiscite, that we would have, like any time since the limits to growth were published and popularized, that we would have a strong majority in favor of steady state economics. If you could explain it well. And what I mean by that is to help people realize what they're already feeling, that the current system isn't working well. So you start there, I think, and then you point out the, the fact that most of our growth lately has been based on debt that is producing instability in, in the economy in general. And then you think about things like, what do we value? Okay? What do we really value? Do we value growth? Well, that's pretty abstract. What does growth mean? It, it, it means wealth for a few, but it doesn't necessarily mean more free time with our families and friends. It doesn't mean vacations. It doesn't mean parental leave. So when we have families, we get to spend time with our young children. So if you began talking about a, an economy that could actually deliver those things at manageable rates of growth, steady state rates of growth, I think you'd get some customers. But that requires producing these ideas in ways that we can share and we can tell stories about and politicians can run on election around. So, so I, I, I think it's, it's a tall order, but I, I'm trying to be as positive, hopeful uh, as, as, as I can about what we need in order to make a change before we end up with some unpleasant political scenarios and some unpleasant planetary scenarios, I would say. Thank you. Okay. I am Jay. And uh, there's, there's some very good points put out here. But to find that information, you're going to have to look for it yourself. Because the chances of seeing it on mainstream media 
with the potential for alienating a sponsor or losing your job, uh, you're going to have to look for it. I've, I've written down several of the publications you put there, but it's a, it's a, it's a missionary work that we have to do to find it. Which is why, uh, with some colleagues, Alan Borning from Computer Science, Derek, Kelsey, Sky, um, we are, and, and former students, I, I'm happy to say, have volunteered to come back and work on the, these projects for no credit, no pay, um, to help design the platform for a global thought collective so that we can have a place to distribute these kinds of materials. Most of the, the books that I've put up here you can get for free if you know where to find them. So we're going to create a sort of a distribution center for good ideas and see if we can bring some activists who are currently working in all of these good causes, winning some battles and losing the war and see if we can bring activists to the ideas to see if we can develop more common issues and framing of those issues. So, so that's, you're absolutely right, and we're working on that problem. Whether we can solve, it's a big problem, you know, so, but, I, but that shouldn't stop us from working on it. So, so stay, I mean, another thing I invite you all to do is stay connected. So we can continue to update you on what we're doing and invite you to help us do it better, because you all have good ideas as well. So. You stated that Trump was a symptom. Yes. And I wondered what kind of talk you would have given, if different, if Hillary had won. You know, I thought about that, and, and, and today I actually thought of an answer to your question, even before you asked it. Um, and the answer is this. It would have been a harder sell because, you know, Bill and Hillary are neoliberal progressives. Right? So there's not, it's not like all neoliberals occupy the exact same space. I mean, Hillary believes that children should not go hungry. So, so, that's, so, so there's a, th th that's the conscience of a neoliberal. A larger role for government. And a larger role for government. On the other hand, if you think about Bill and, and indeed Hillary supporting his policies, he was instrumental indeed without Bill the banking deregulation would not have happened would not have happened the telecommunication deregulation would not have happened without the Clintons and so 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 the the the, the, the dilemma is if Hillary had been elected I would have I think had a tougher sell to y'all because I would have to convince you that the problem exists but it would have a nicer face You referred to the perfect storm that brought about the neoclassical liberalism and the, I guess, the pain of stagflation, the OPEC oil crisis, and so on. Did we miss our perfect storm with the bailout, or should we have let it crash? No, the storm is uh, still, it, it, it's not as intense. I mean, the, the bailout kind of calmed the storm, but the economy is not working. I mean, you know. Greece is a basket case. Italy is this close to being a basket case. Spain is this close to being a basket case. And indeed, many of these economies are working at best as basket cases. So the, the, the economy today is so precarious that I could imagine a little perturbation sending it all down again. So, so I don't think we're out of the woods at all. I mean, the bailout simply created a colossal amount of debt, and uh, since none of the bankers went to jail or even uh, were disciplined or re-regulated substantially, the problem persists. So, and I think that many, many people, both on the right and on the left, I mean, the, the, the dilemma is, you know, the right is rising, Tea Party was a about economic problems, a different configuration of them, but the Occupy protests and indeed protests that continue around the world today are about the economic crisis that many people feel has not been resolved. Trump 
got elected because he appealed to people who understood that their economic situation in part looked precarious. So are we taking it down? Now? Today we are. The quest, but, but so we have, I think this is a, a continuing open window of opportunity. And we have time, not a lot of time, but I think we have time to try and figure out what to do creatively in that opportunity window. So, so let's put our minds together and come up with some good ideas and figure out how to promote them. That's, that's my bit. Because if it closes again, I mean, th th there is a chance that the window closes and we end up with um, a kind of weird postmodern version of national socialism, right? Trump, Trump is not the worst case. Trump is by far from the worst case. So, so the window could close, but as long as it's still open, I think we've got an opportunity to try and figure out how to get democracy back for the people, create an economy that works for the people, and doesn't kill the environment. I mean, these are, again, if you think about the simplicity of these ideas, these are every bit as simple as the neoliberal <coughs> holy trinity. They're just radically different in what they would produce. And they are subject to empirical scrutiny. Happily so. We can do science with these ideas. We can see if democracy is representing people. Well, we have. We can see if the economy is benefiting people. And we have. And we can see how the environment is doing with a new economy. And we will. Or we hope we will. Uh, my, my concern is that um, I'm not sure that the whole world will get around the idea of a sustainable environment. Uh, in, in Europe, youth employment is 20%. I remember in Washington State uh, in the 1980s when we went through the spotted owl thing, um, nobody cared about owls, they cared about jobs. Jobs, jobs, jobs. So I think that uh, the answer to the, what is the purpose of the economy for me is um, to provide work for everybody who wants it that's, that's dignified and not exploitive. So I think that what the progressives have to come up with is a formula and an argument that explains how we put this vast number of people to work that don't have work. And when it comes to the United States and the notion of family leave and all that, we still have some vast number of people who don't take the vacation days they're earned, um, are afraid to take family leave. We're the most driven people, it seems, anywhere. It seem. So it would I seem. think that the key to this thing is jobs, 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 jobs. Everything that any well, politician says or any businessman says yeah. it always leads with jobs. I mean, I, I agree with you in a way. I mean, first of all, all the trends are robots, 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 okay? And crappy jobs upon crappy jobs. So, so, so the job trends are looking like service industry jobs, whereas decent manufacturing jobs are, in, and in many professional level jobs are being replaced by automation and robots. So Bill Gates the other day though, I mean, surprisingly, I, I don't agree with a lot of what Bill Gates says, um, but I think he occasionally pops off with a pretty good idea. I don't believe that technology is going to solve our environment crisis, which he says every once in a while. But the other day, he said that robots should pay taxes. Hey, that's an interesting idea. He said, well, corporations are saving money by not having to, as Puzder said, deal with annoying you know, workers who show up sick or want to have time off with their families or, or you know, go out on strike, heaven forbid. And uh, robots don't do any of those things. But Bill Gates the other day said, but maybe we should actually make robots pay taxes. Ah. So there's an idea. And where would the tax money go? Well, the tax money could actually go to doing what Alaska, which is not you know, a hotbed of left-wing politics, but the conservative citizenry of Alaska didn't have trouble 
getting a, an annual payment of some substantial number of dollars. So I don't think it would be a hard sell to say, you know, let's organize the economy. If automation is going to happen, so be it. But let's distribute the proceeds from automation back to people who could have more time to take those vacations that we're not taking now. So, so I think that, and, and these ideas are happening in Europe. I mean, Germany could be a much more automated society, but actually, despite having neoliberal tendencies, German politics is still committed to the idea of public welfare. Imagine that, taking care of the people. Sweden, despite having a very aggressive business economy, still believes in taking care of the people. What a concept. We've kind of lost that one. So, so I don't think, though, that when you explain the future in these simple terms, that people are going to say, let me see, should I take that you know, minimum guaranteed income check or not? I think people will take it. And, and there's a lot of detail. We are way behind in that conversation, way behind compared to uh, most, most of Northern Europe, certainly. So, so I think that there are going to be big changes. The question is, are we even addressing them in this country? And, and largely not, is the answer. Largely not. So let's open to, to these kinds of ideas, because I, they're coming. And the question is, will we have some ideas that we can present when things like uh, no more good jobs happen? Um, and, and I think that that's a welcome change if we handle it right. Oh, okay. I understand what you're saying about framing the message in a be better way so it appeals to people, but my concern is that the country is so polarized and the people in power are profiting from, it's in their interest to maintain that polarization, mm -hmm. that it seems like that message will be preaching to the choir. My understanding is that a lot of the people who are the most upset about the economy view people like those of us in this room as the elites. And they aren't sure. interested, in, sure. interested in hearing, they aren't interested in engaging in a debate. They already know what they think. But you know what? We don't have to convince everybody. We have plenty of people who would join a movement. You don't need everybody. I mean, they, I'm not sensing that the people who wouldn't be listening to us care very deeply about us anyway. So, but on the other hand, on the other hand, they might actually like the kind of society we could produce. Who knew? Lots of times people don't see the future until it hits them in the face. And sometimes, I mean, think about civil rights. You had to enforce laws to protect civil rights from people who were abusing all kinds of civil rights. But those laws made a difference. So just as neoliberalism came to power through power, so could a better world that a lot of people might decide they liked pretty well. So I don't think it's going to be a big deliberation that we're going to have that's going to produce this change. I think it's going to be politics. I don't think it takes that many people. I mean, if you think about movements, movements have never swept the entire society. They've made an impact. They've shaken up an entire society. But they've never involved everybody. All they involve are enough people with the right message and the commitment to make things happen. So I, don't, I think a minority can do this. I think a minority can do it. It's about power. It's about power wielded by the people. What's that? A minority did. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Exactly. No, no, you're absolutely right. I mean, the, the story I told about neoliberalism is the story of a very small minority taking over the world. Thanks. No, no, not at all. That's, that's kind of the point, isn't it? OK, one more question, uh, two more questions, because you've had your hand up, too. So, so, I, then, so yes? I, 
I hear a little bit of a contradiction uh, with respect to growth because I certainly understand a steady state economy which would rise or fall depending on the population. But you said, but some growth is okay. Well, is some growth okay? In which case, how much? How do you determine it? Et cetera. I mean, you know, the, the, the answer to that question will necessarily be based on experimentation, right? If you, if you have an idea system that's open to empirical feedback, you can learn the answer to that question. So nobody knows right now how much is desirable, but one thing we can guess is that certain kinds of growth are really undesirable. Speculation that is paper chasing paper, making people wealthy on paper that's not producing schools or roads or other kinds of public, or vacation time, that, that that's not productive growth. So we might, in advance, figure that out. But then for other how much and what kind, I think that requires empirical evaluation. And that's, that's sort of how Roosevelt got through the Depression. It was a, he, he, he said, look, I don't, we don't have all the answers. We're going to continue experimenting till we find stuff that works. And, and it sort of did. So. Um, yeah, my idea would be the growth could be in alternative energy and clean energy as the biggest movement. Uh, my interest is in looking at where the money goes. There have been a couple of great rallies lately um, in front of Wells Fargo to divest because they were um, financing the pipeline, bringing the tar sands the, uh, through the uh, reservation at Standing Rock. And I think it's showing us, uh, I think as more and more of these protests about divestment are taking place, it's showing us what these big institute, big banks that are too big to fail are doing. They're investing in private prisons too. Uh, the other thing is to look at uh, everybody's being forced to invest in stocks or that are so volatile now or in bonds that hardly pay anything because of inflation. And I think we have to figure out how to back that up when a coffee is four dollars now. I mean, it's pretty nuts. I would mention Three, very quickly, I'd mention three very hopeful things. There's th three sustainable indexes coming on the stock market. The stock market has never mo uh, measured sustainable um, stocks before. That is hopeful. And that's, yeah. hope that's just being bought by Standard & Poor's coming out by uh, right. True Cost. And the um, other very hopeful thing is Barron's, the financial newspaper printed 200 of the best sustainable funds. So these are very mainstream things. This is, to me, very encouraging little chinks yeah. in the economy. I mean, there, are, there are a lot of positive trends. The question is, can we ramp them up and connect them yeah. and uh, yeah, exactly. end up generating a movement that changes the world? Thank you very much.